But what we're going to work on today is we are going to look at some dates, some very important dates in Jewish history that are crucial for us to understand for this year. I am going to start actually with a number line. Okay? Now, I am not a math teacher. However, on the right side of zero is what? The right side of zero on math, what do you do? Negative. You, is positive. Left side is negative. negative. What does your math teacher tell you? Your math teacher tells you that when you're writing a positive number, do I need to include the positive sign? No. No, I do not need to include the positive sign. What, what does she tell you about the negative number? You have to include the negative. That you have to include. What happens if you don't include the negative number? Yeah, the negative sign. Positive. Then your answer is? Positive. It's positive. And so what happens to your answer? No. It's wrong. Well, let's take that idea from, a, ta from a, a number line and let's shift it to a timeline. On the right side of zero, do we need to indicate that the date is on the right side of the zero? No. no. Do we need to indicate if the date is on the left side of the zero? Yes. Yes. What do I need to write? BCE. Very important that I write the letters BCE. So the same way I wouldn't drop the negative sign, it's the same way I do not drop those letters either. If you don't write BCE, you automatically assume that the number is on the right side of the zero like a positive number. Okay? Now, important information for us to understand is that in this class we only use the secular dates. And it's just for one simple reason is that I think we're able to relate to that. If I tell you that an event happened in 1500, what would you tell me? How many years ago was that? Approximately? 400. Approximately? How many? 500. Approximately 500, right? So you're able to do that math like this. You're able to do calculate and you can relate to it. If I tell you that this event happened in, 13, in the 1300s, what would you tell me approximately how many years ago was that? 700. You see how you can relate to that much better? And that's why I only use the secular dates. The Hebrew dates, a lot of times we tend to start calculating. It is an unfortunate reality of us living in Gullet today, is that we live in a secular world and we need to be able to, and to adapt and we need to be able to relate to that. And that's why I only use the secular dates. So you may have learned some of the Hebrew dates before. It's great. I wish we can do that. I just trying to, to try to streamline things and making it a little easier. We tend to, I only will use the secular dates. Okay, so whatever dates I'm going to use are secular. We use a lot of dates. I will tell you very clearly which dates you're responsible for. Okay, so we'll use dates. I would recommend that you jot them down and you use them or we'll reference them. But as far as like having to actually know certain dates, those are the ones I'm going to tell you exactly which ones you need to know. And before a test, I'm going to, before a test, um, I'll, I'll, we'll go through it exactly which ones we need to know. It's not that many. Don't worry. So here we go. We're going to start with some important dates. We're going to start with Horban Bayit Rishon and Horban Bayit Shani. Do we have secular dates for those years, for those events? Secular dates. Go ahead. Okay, so we have 422 BCE for Horban Bayit Rishon. I must have the BCE. Can we plot that on our timeline? Where would I put it? Approx where would I put it? Left or right? I would put it left. And again, I would, let's say, put it, let's put it over here. So I'm going to do Horban 1 right over here. As I go closer to the zero, what happens to the numbers? They go up or down? down. They go down. So I go down 422 and it goes down to zero and then we restart. So when I say we're in the year 2020, I'm going to put 2020 all the way over here. It is 2020 from what? From zero. From zero. Zero marks? Jesus. Uh, marks Christianity. Correct. So we are going to... Now, now, ladies, with that idea, 2020 is marking ourselves to Christianity. Do we really want to identify ourselves like that? No, we, want, would perf we would much rather use the Hebrew dates, which mark ourselves to where? To Briyat Olam from the start of the world. Okay? Now, Chorban Bayacheni, what's the date for Chorban Bayacheni, ladies? Chorban Bayacheni, go ahead. 70. 70, correct. It is 70, and I do not need to put any indication afterwards because it is 70 after the zero. So it's pretty close to zero. I'll do Chorban number two. Now, let's just do some important details over here. Who destroyed the first Beit HaMikdash, ladies? Who? Go ahead. Nebuchadnezzar Melech? Bavel. Nebuchadnezzar Melech Bavel is the one responsible for destroying the first Beit HaMikdash. So Bavel is the one responsible for destroying the first Beit HaMikdash. Where were the Jews exiled to? Where were the majority? I'm going to say majority because it's not all. Majority of them went to? 
Bavel. That is correct. The majority of the Jews ended up in Bavel. Bavel today is modern day what country? Syria. It is modern day Iraq. Iraq. Now the smart board is very unclear today, um, uh, but I will show you as soon as we can get a clearer map, it just to see so you can map out the countries and you can see Israel versus Iraq. Now, Chorim Bayit Cheney, who's responsible for destroying the second Beit HaMikdash? Go ahead. Melech. Rome, correct. The Romans are the ones responsible for destroying the second Beit HaMikdash. Where were the majority of the Jews exiled to? And again, I say majority, so there were others that were scattered into other places. Most of the Jews went where? Now, some of you correct, some Jews went to Rome. But the majority of the Jews went where? Majority went to? Majority, close. The majority then went to? The majority went right back to where? They went back to? They were exiled from Eretz Yisrael. They went to? Bavel. That is correct. Okay? Now, in both cases, Jews did end up in other countries. In both cases, Jews did end up in other countries, but we're looking at it from a majority perspective. Both times, the Jews ended up in Babel. Now, if Rome is the one responsible for destroying the Beit HaMikdash, yes, many Jews, most of them went to Babel, but there were Jews that, do you think the Romans took back home Jews with them? Did the Romans take Jews back yeah. home? Rome is in where? In? Italy. in Italy. Do you think that some Jews that were taken back to Italy with them? Yeah. Yes, 100%. Some Jews ended up going back to Italy, going with them back to Italy, and they got scattered to the countries surrounding Italy. Some Jews ended up in Turkey, and some Jews ended up in Greece, but majority ended up in Babel. With me? Yeah. Okay. Now, they lived in Babel. They lived in Babel, and they lived in Babel, and they lived in Babel, and they lived in Babel. And then what happens? Over the years, life becomes challenging in Babel. And Jews are slowly moving out of Bubble and finding new places to be able to settle in. So the community gets smaller and smaller, and it slowly starts to dwindle. That's in about the 700s. The Jews start to leave Bubble and find new settlements and new places to be able to move to. And we, I want to talk a little bit about where do the Jews start to find communities and start to build, and you know, there were Jews living in some of these places, and they just continue to expand these communities. And eventually, what happens is, as the years go on, eventually the Jewish community in Bavel dies out. The end of Bavel, of life in Bavel, is marked by the year 1038. Let me make that a little clearer. The, is marked by the year 1038. Very important date that we are going to reference several times and throughout the year. We're going to keep referencing this, this date. And the reason for that is when I say it's the end of Bavel, I also say that it marks the end in a generation of Jewish leaders. Now, what does that mean? Is we know our Mesora, and the Mesora we know it goes Tanaim, and then it goes Amoraim, and then it goes Savoraim, and then we have Gaonim, and then we have Rishonim, and then we have Acharonim. So that is our Mesora. 1038 marks the end of one of those Tkufot. Does anybody know which Tkufa it ends? Tanaim, Amoram, Savoram, Gaonim, Rishonim, Acharonim. Anybody know which Tkufa it ends? Go ahead. It marks the end of the Gaonim. It's a very important year because it marks the end of the Gaonim. So it's the Sof Gaonim. It marks the end of the Gaonim. Does anybody know who the last Gaon was? And in 1038, he died. Anybody know his name? It's an easy name to remember. Go ahead. His name was Rav Hai Gaon. Correct. Excellent. His name was Rav Hai. Okay, easy, to, easy enough to remember. That was his death in 1038, and it marks the end of the Gaonim. It marks the Sof Tkufat HaGaonim, it's the end of that era. And from the, after the Gaonim, we move on into the Tkufa of the, of the Rishonim. And that's predominantly the Tkufa that we're going to be talking about. Again, it's not like, okay, so anybody who lived after, third, what happens if someone was born in, in 1030? Are they Gaon or are they a Rishon? It, again, it's, it really, you know, it's not like it's set in stone like that. But when Rav Hai died, that marks the end of the Gaon. Questions before I continue?